On this week's episode of Local Matters, we go on the local scene with Community Art Collaborative's latest public art installation. Talk with Melissa Kenny and Jackie Millar of Healthy Plymouth bring you government stories you may have missed on Snapshot, and highlight what's happening in our South Shore towns. I'm Elizabeth Shanahan Jewett. Let's get started. Community Art Collaborative has completed another installation of their inaugural program, In This Together, a community-created collaborative public art project. The local scene was there. Oh my goodness, we're in the town of Plymouth, Massachusetts. We're at the headquarters of the administration building on Lincoln Road. And today is our big unveiling of a huge dream come true. And it started with a conversation. And now we have over a thousand works of art in one art installation. And what better place to have it housed right here, where everyone in the town at one point or another has to come through here. I think what's important is to backtrack a little bit and so when we were talking about what In This Together was going to look like and, and kind of McLena and Jen's vision, the first word that came to our minds was, you know, inclusivity and making sure that everybody was represented. And it was a pretty in-depth process to create all of this and mostly it was involved with love and concern for, you know, what we'd all collectively been through and how we were expressing that experience. I got involved in the installation um, through my, my art teacher, um, Miss Lauren Jazerski. Um, I was a part of the art program at Plymouth North High School in my junior year. She said, hey, like, would you like to do something over the summer? And I said, let's do it. I'm so excited. What we did was provided the students with honeycombs. They, could, they were prompting questions on the back related to how they were dealing with the pandemic and, and what they missed and how it affected them. You know what really hit home is when somebody shared with me, their daughter is a senior in high school right now. Her last regular normal school year was her freshman year. I mean, look at the, de the development that happens between your freshman year and your senior year. So it was really important to have something dedicated just to students and teachers so that they could process. We know that art is healing. Um, we know that art brings people together. And what better way than to have a collaborative piece where it's kind of the sum of all the pieces when you look at it. I'm not just saying the school piece, but the hospital piece and perseverance that was at Hedge House. But each artist, no matter how old, could go up and point to what their contribution was, you know, and take ownership of that and hopefully some healing. I wanted to get involved with this project because I'm somebody who takes any opportunity they can to express myself with art. And when it came to COVID-19 and everything I've been through and how I've changed, I just saw it as the perfect opportunity to do that while being involved with my school community and my town all in one. Personally, I wanted to get involved in this project because I think um, it means a lot to the community and myself. Being able to kind of help the community heal after such an unprecedented time, which I'm sure everyone's sick of hearing, but it really was difficult for everyone. And just being able to like contribute what I was feeling through art, which helped myself heal and I think also helped the community heal as well. The collaboration is, is the great part, right? It's working with different partners. It's working with a Community Arts Collaborative. It's working with all of the art teachers, the art students, the, the administration at each building. It's working with the Plymouth Bay Cultural District. It's working with the town of Plymouth and Robin Carver needs a big shout out because she's a big part of this as well. All those pieces going together and it can be hard sometimes, right? It can be really difficult uh, to put all the pieces together and get all the yeses and funding and the community will benefit from seeing it as well and seeing the reaction and the outpouring of thought and beliefs from the student artists. The response has been overwhelmingly positive. People feel invested. This is an opportunity where you see public art that someone in your town or your family has helped to create. So there's a real personal investment. They're very excited to go through and see these installations and point out, my child did this, or my daughter did this, or you know, my aunt or uncle participated. Again, it's an opportunity for people in the community to come back together and look at, this is how community works together. And I hope for people who might not have had an artistic 
you know, contribution, they can look at it and, and feel, right? And they can look at all the individual parts and, and just maybe bring some, some healing, some processing, and maybe that'll inspire them to go home and do the same because when words fail, art takes over. All the things that we need to do to be a healthy community moving forward. So we, we get a lot of, yes, we should do that. In fact, we've had people approach us and say, hey, how do we, how do we get involved? What can we, you know, can we do one? Um, and we're happy to say now we have a whole process and plan around how people can do this. People can get involved by going to our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and our website at communityartcollaborative.org. You know, a big part of this is about being accessible. So one thing that we have work to do on is, you know, ensuring that all our social media posts are accessible. We're also looking for an interpreter, um, an ASL interpreter, and we are working on ensuring that this will also include Braille. So this truly is an inclusive process. And so you can help us write grants. You can do social media with us. You can also do art. We, you know, we will be um, getting together and and figuring out what the next you know set of projects are. We have a number of them with the library and the Herring Palm Wampanoag that are coming up. We're all invested in belonging right now and especially when we've been so isolated for so long. You don't have to be an artist to feel like you're contributing and that you, you belong to something. Um, and even if you're a patron, that is participation, right? Because you're taking in what the artist intended and maybe putting your own spin on it and its interpretation. Art is the glue that keeps us together. And again, it's not just visual arts. It can be dance, it can be theater, it can be comedy, you know, whatever it is, but it brings us together. I mean, in this together, isn't that perfect? We knew coming out of COVID um, that the arts were gonna be the leading economic driver. It's what people were yearning for. People are gonna want to be in a theater together. They're gonna wanna hear music together. They're gonna wanna go to a show. And I think it, we're seeing it, it's happening. To get involved, support, or create with CAC, visit communityartcollaborative.org. Ezra Weston established the Weston family merchant and shipbuilding firm before the Revolutionary War, which went on to become Duxbury's largest business. Ezra also had a large personality and influence on local politics, earning him the nickname King Caesar. After his death, the nickname passed on to his son, Ezra Weston II, who expanded the shipping firm with a large fleet of sailing vessels and record-breaking cargoes. On Thursday, May 19th at 6.30 p.m., join the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society at the Drew Archival Library on St. George Street for the presentation, King Caesar of Duxbury. Author Patrick Brown will go beyond mythology to analyze the firm's business practices and key factors to its success. This program will also humanize this local legend. Visit DuxburyHistory.org to register. The month of May means sunshine, outdoor activities, and music in the park. Gray's Beach is the setting for two community music events in May. The Darren Bissett Band will grace the beach with original country music and some covers on May 17th, and popular singer-songwriter and guitarist Phil Pacino performs on May 31st. The music plays at 6 p.m. both evenings. Pack your lawn chair and meet up with friends. Parking is limited but open to the public for these events. No sticker required. Food trucks, just the dip, and brews and chew will be there to add to the fun. Visit kingstonrec.com to learn more. A collaboration between Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital Plymouth, the Plymouth Public Schools, leadership of the Town of Plymouth, and local organizations, Healthy Plymouth has a unified goal, to enrich the quality of our lives through better health. Julie Thompson spoke to Melissa Kenny and Jackie Millar. I'm so pleased to welcome today both Melissa Kenny and Jackie Miller of the Healthy Plymouth used to be initiative and now it's a 501c3. So let's talk about that. Melissa, can you talk a little bit about how you got to where you are right now with Healthy Plymouth? Sure, I'm the president and CEO of Healthy Plymouth and I joined the organization in 2017. Um, I came to the organization at the request of the then chair, Judy Vigna, uh, because of work I was doing with youth at Algonquin Heights. And you know, just briefly, my background is in um, dis the disability field. I've been in human services and nonprofit management for a little over 30 years. 
Okay, excellent. And Jackie, how did you get involved? So again, Judy Vigna was my contact as well, but I got a permaculture design certification in 2015. I had been a real estate lawyer for 30 years in Boston, and I wanted to teach. So between the permaculture design certification and growing up in North Adams with two apple trees in my backyard, it all seemed to come together. So the school um, and community garden initiative is something really close to my heart, and teaching kids about where their food comes from and being outside in the garden has been a really a passion of mine. So here we are today. Okay, so let's just, just go back a tiny bit for one second. So actual, Healthy Plymouth actually is a, a collaboration between Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital of Plymouth, uh, Plymouth Public Schools, the town of Plymouth, leadership, and local organizations. So you, you all get together and you, basically your single goal is to enrich the quality of lives through better health, correct? Through better health and through better social emotional health too for the youth. Perfect. And providing them, providing them with activities of engagement um, you know, that can hone interest in, and help them think about their future. Okay. And over the past five years, you've done a lot of different initiatives. But the one we really want to talk about today is the Edible School and Community Gardens Permaculture Clubs. Um, and what, what does that mean? That's a mouthful. Uh, so to the people that don't know what that is, who would like to explain what it is and, and how people get involved with it? Sure. So over the past five years, we've installed 13 school and community gardens in Plymouth. So those are really the places that people can gather, do some community gardening, or for the schools, we have clubs either before school, after school, during school, whatever suits that school. So those clubs really focus on kids being out in the garden, reflecting on nature, finding out where their food comes from, because a lot of kids unfortunately don't know that. So it gives them kind of a place to that's a level playing field for all the kids. And I think that's a really wonderful place for kids to be and to build some confidence and feel comfortable being outside in nature and bringing some of those skills home to their parents. And in the summer, we have um, Sign Up Genius available for the families to take a week in the garden so they can maintain the garden and harvest the garden and help the garden stay happy and healthy all summer long. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, do you do nutrition as well as plant? I mean, is that part of this whole program is, is yeah. kind of an education about nutrition? So one of the partners that we've had over the past five years is Carol Guerin, it's UMass Extension. She goes into the classroom and talks about nutrition through her program and then goes out to the garden as well and highlights that. We also have Marsha Richards, who's been a partner yeah. at Beth Israel Deaconess. She's a nutritionist as well, and she's great. And we have her lots of times come down to the community garden at Algonquin Heights for any of the school programming we did when we had the one week April vacation program. She was there, we made lunch with the kids and yeah. we really focused yeah. on local foods when we had her come down. So we tracked the miles, the food miles it took for the produce to be grown and to be used. And I think that's a really important lesson as well. So kids understand what local food means and what the impact on the environment is if you're mm -hmm. getting food flown in from Hawaii if you're going to eat a pineapple. So those are the types of things that we talk about with the kids to get them thinking about local types of issues right. on a global scale. And most kids, you'd, you'd never think that. I mean, you'd never think how long did it, this particular thing that I'm going to eat, how long did it take to get here? Now, what about mm -hmm. the fact that um, in the winter, clearly you can't have outside gardens. What, what, what does this program look like in the winter months? So again, we can certainly go into the classrooms. I just started a program at Rising Tide, that's our latest garden. And so we grew some um, sprouts on the windowsill. And that's again, that's food footsteps instead of food miles, right? Mm -hmm. So teaching kids mm -hmm. that you grow some of your own food in different ways, hydroponically on the windowsill, those again are some lessons that they take home with them and understand, hey mom, I don't think we're gonna buy this tomato from Florida. Maybe we should find a hydroponic one that's grown fairly locally. So those types of things you can certainly do in the winter as well, just to have the kids have an idea, again, where their food comes from. And do you br bring into this at all the incredible cost of shipping food versus, Oh yeah. I mean, because everyone will, will say now, and I'm sure the kids have heard their parents say how much the prices have gone up, especially for produce and things like that in the grocery stores. So that's another whole element that the kids are learning about, yes? Right, so yesterday I was at Nathaniel Morton, it was our first kickoff of our YMCA partnership for the After School Garden Club. And we did an exercise about a pineapple, that it came from Hawaii and finally got to Shaw's in Plymouth and then someone bought it. 
That was 5,000 miles it took to get the pineapple from Hawaii here. And then we did the farmer's market analysis. So if they grew corn in Plimpton and sold it at the Plymouth farmer's market, that was 15 miles and you got to meet the farmer. So we talk a little bit about the impact on the environment when you're flying a pineapple from Hawaii all the way here, driving across the country and then buying it. So that makes kids think a little bit more deeply about what they do from morning to night and that's super important. Right, and that's the whole point. Melissa, what other initiatives have you been involved with in the past or you're thinking of for the future, aside from this wonderful program about healthy growing and eating? So aside from uh, the garden program, um, certainly April Vacation, that was one of our signature events that we held every year, uh, free for middle school kids um, who live in Plymouth. And, you know, we would love to see that um, kick off again this coming April, um, a full week of just multi, multi-programming, um, everything under the sun from arts to the garden to exercise, drums alive, hip hop dancing, it, you know, it's just wonderful. So we'd like to bring that back. Um, one thing I'd like to mention though is a really important outreach offshoot of the garden program. And that's our relationship with Algonquin Heights and creating a mobile farmer's market. Um, and so, you know, thanks to Jackie's involvement at Algonquin Heights and connections that we made in the community, we were able to create and still have this amazing inclusive summer program where we partnered with the Department of Developmental Services, uh, with New England Villages, with Colchester Farm, and with Algonquin Heights, employing teens from Algonquin Heights to work at Colchester Farm uh, pre-pandemic and also at the garden that Jackie um, manages at Algonquin Heights and providing fresh organic produce for free uh, to households at Algonquin Heights um, through a farmer's market. Wow, and it, it was, it's incredible how many different organizations you can, you can thread together to do this. And, you, and it was so wonderful, such a learning experience for the youth because they were working side by side with adults with developmental and intellectual disabilities mm -hmm. whose employment program is working at Colchester Farm. And we were able to do some group um, programs. So we had a florist come in and, and show them floral design. Um, you know, we had somebody come in and talk about goals and future planning and, and everybody was included. We had a big pizza party at the end of the summer. Um, and so the impact was, you know, to the residents of Algonquin Heights who had access now to, you know, delicious produce, right. um, you know, to the families that got to come to the farm for a special farmers, day, you know, farm farm day, and just learning about pe differences in people, you right. know, differences but, but more about commonalities, right? Right. Um, and, and so far, all of the youth that have been involved in that program each summer mm -hmm. have found jobs in the community. Wow. So it helped those resumes. Wow. And sometimes when you're working on a common goal, um, working side by side with all kinds of different people. It, it, the goal is what becomes important, and the people are just your your coworkers. You, they just you know they're. Uh, it's wonderful what you're doing now. Are there other towns that have this kind of a program, or 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 can how do you facilitate this so that other towns can do this? Hmm. I mean, I think it's a wonderful model. Yeah. And, you know, and if I'm being honest, when we were applying for our 501c3 um, status, we had a little bit of issue because there are other communities that have healthy in front of their town name. And so maybe doing something similar, but whether that's focused on youth, which ours is, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Sure, okay. And how can people get involved that want to support you or volunteer, how can they do that? They can contact us certainly at healthyplymouth um, at gmail.com. Uh, which would be great. They can visit our website, but certainly um, watch our social media, both um, Tara Cure's social media and Healthy Plymouth, because we will be loading up our Sign Up Genius uh, to get involved and sign up for garden care. That's great. And do you have any overall summer programs that you run? So the summer programs will include that farmer's market that I just spoke about. Yep. And then, you know, really looking at maybe doing some programming because the gardens are not just gardens, they're outdoor classrooms. Sure, and, exactly. You know, Jack can speak to some of the awesome things that she's done, you know, in the gardens in terms of beekeeping and, and other activities. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Jackie, can you just give us in our last minute or so a couple of things that, sure. that go on? Yeah, absolutely. So we can do summer in the garden. Lots of times we do 
one outreach event on a Wednesday at one of the gardens and spend a home and, you know, on social media what's going to happen. So we can have an herbalist come. I'm a beekeeper. I could certainly do a beekeeping presentation. So we really want the gardens to be meeting places, community engagement spots. So as the summer progresses, we'll put out some dates and times for folks to come to the garden and all participate there. Great, because the, the gardens are there all the time. They don't go anywhere, right? They don't yeah, end when the school right. year ends, also, right? That's wonderful. We also do something called the tomato sauce initiative too. So we collect tomatoes and basil and oregano from all the school gardens. And Patrick Bancott, the food service director at the Plymouth Public Schools makes the tomato sauce and we serve it in the fall at the schools. So that's a real touching kind of grasping, I can smell it, eat it, touch it type of thing. And the kids love that to know the tomatoes came from their school gardens. Yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah. Good for you. Ladies, thank you so much. What wonderful work you're doing. Pleasure. Um, thank you. Thank you. To find out more, visit the Healthy Plymouth Facebook page. When crossing a muddy road, ladies, do you raise your dress with your right hand only? To use both hands would be vulgar if you were living in Victorian America. On Saturday, May 14th from 2 to 3 p.m., join Janet Parnes of Historical Portrayals by Lady J at the Pembroke Public Library as she takes you on a promenade through the age of gentility. The etiquette expert of 1890 will guide you through a proper afternoon tea where you will sip and nibble as essential topics are presented. They of course include tea etiquette, fan language, corsets, calling cards, courtship scandals, and more. Your company is kindly requested. RSVP through the Pembroke Public Library website. If you're a teen who would love to read more stories with LGBTQ plus main characters, the Plymouth Public Library would love to help. Read the Rainbow is a brand new library-led book club for teens with complex and disparate reading choices. You might read about astronauts, royals, wizards, or just human beings who are in love. But every selected title features undeniably LGBTQ plus characters as its stars. At the first Read the Rainbow Book Club meeting on May 18th from 6 to 7 p.m., you'll discuss Heartstopper by Alice Oseman, a coming-of-age series in which teens Nick and Charlie realize their unlikely friendship might be something more. Originally a webcomic on Tumblr, Heartstopper has an online fan base with over 52 million views and is now a brand new Netflix series. Copies are available to check out at the circulation desk. All Read the Rainbow Book Club meetings will be held in the teen space on the second floor. For more information about this group, contact Priya Tate at ptait at plymouth.ocln.com. Up next is Mark McKinley with an all-new Snapshot. Welcome to Snapshot, where we take a local look at the government stories that you may have missed. The Baker Polito administration announces grants for towns to purchase automated external defibrillators for public safety and first responder vehicles. This funding will equip more than 200 vehicles and approximately 70% of the cities and towns in the Commonwealth, including the towns of Duxbury, Kingston, Pembroke, and Plymouth. The AEDs will help first responders improve cardiac patient care and emergency response. In state budget news, the House passed a $49.7 billion fiscal 2023 budget at the end of April, adding almost $130 million in spending through several large amendments. Some of the amendments included cover environmental affairs, housing, and energy, along with $15 million for mass hire, which connects businesses and job seekers through a statewide network. Locally, state representatives were able to have several of their amendments adopted. Funds would be provided to Habitat of Humanity of Greater Plymouth to purchase a new box truck to help them stock the ReStore in Carver. To the town of Plymouth to replace 15-year-old motors on the Plymouth Police Department's patrol and rescue boats. And to the town of Pembroke for improvements to the Mattachusett Street ball fields. The House will approve a final amended version of the budget, which will be sent to the Senate for consideration. To follow along with the process, you can visit malegislature.gov or follow our state delegation on social media for updates.
The town of Plymouth has funds available that can be used for housing rehabilitation loans. Homeowners of low and moderate income can use the funds for making repairs related to health and safety issues, such as lead, leaky roofs, repair or replace septic systems, and much more. These are 2% interest deferred payment loans. To find out more information, you can contact the Plymouth Office of Community Development at 508 322-3320 or visit their page on the Town of Plymouth's website. Pembroke Town Meeting will be held Tuesday, May 10th at 7 p.m. at Pembroke High School. The town is encouraging voters to arrive at 6.15 p.m. to get checked in so that the meeting can start at 7 p.m. PAC TV will be providing live coverage on the Pembroke Government Channel that night. You can also visit PACTV.org to review meeting coverage and discussions leading up to town meeting. Following Pembroke, Kingston's annual town meeting will be held on Saturday, May 14th at 9 a.m. at the Kingston Intermediate School. Visit KingstonMA.gov to review town budget information leading up to the meeting. And PAC TV will be covering the meeting live on the Kingston Government Channel. Thanks for watching this edition of Snapshot. I'm Mark McKinley, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Mark. Meditation doesn't always involve sitting. A walking meditation can also bring you into the present moment, practicing awareness of how your mind and body feel when you're moving. Join meditation teacher Betsy Hall for a mindful walk at Wildlands Trust on May 18th from 9 to 12 p.m. You'll meet Betsy at 43 West Long Pond Road and together embark on an approximately two mile walk over hilly terrain through Big Pond Loop. Betsy has studied meditation with Zen masters, Buddhist teachers, and Christian leaders. She believes that nature is one of the greatest meditation guides there is and loves to lead walking meditations in the forest. Visit wildlandstrust.org to register. The South Shore Fun Lovers Group is getting back on the road. On Thursday, May 12th, Old Sturbridge Village is the destination where stories of the past come to life with a break for lunch at the Public House Historic Inn. The fun lovers have lots more planned for this summer. For questions and to book your spot, please contact Patty at 508-746-1750. And please follow the local scene by PAC TV on YouTube, social media, or our website for more of what's good and good to know in our community. That wraps this episode of Local Matters. From all of us at PAC TV, have a safe and happy week. We will see you next time. Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to The Local Scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.